You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bill Medicine Podcast. I am... Your host, Koku, here with you once again. Uh, We're going to get back to reading some papers tonight. Tonight, we're going to read a paper. This paper is titled Pan-African Linguistic and Cultural Unity, a Basis for Pan-Africanism in the African Renaissance. Uh, You see the author is... Simpiwi uh, Sasanti. It's an interesting first part of his name, Simp. But Simpiwi Sasante is the author. The abstract reads, well, you know, before I get into the paper and the abstract, let me remind you that this podcast is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. On this network, we have a few shows with more shows coming down uh, the pipe later on in the year and you should check out some of the other shows on the podcast network this is DA asking you tune into the harsh reality podcast providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community only on KWAZ radio peace family this is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. That's right. Check out those shows as well as the Queen's Council Podcast. I don't have a... I don't have the 10-second bump for her show. I haven't received it. But, yeah, check out the Queen's Council Podcast as well. Uh, The Harsh Reality Podcast just dropped an episode uh, this past weekend. Check it out. Good episode. Uh, you know, the warship happened on Sunday for the pro-black perspective. Make sure to check out the warship. All right. And uh, here we are, the Bit of Medicine podcast. And we're reading this paper today. All right. Pan-African linguistic cultural unity basis for Pan-Africanism, the African Renaissance by Simp Hewe Sasanti. The abstract reads, contrary to the view that Africa is populated by many ethnic groups whose cultures and languages have no relation to one another, scientific research, as opposed to impressionistic arguments, points to the fact that African languages are connected and by extension demonstrate African cultural connectivity and unity. By making reference to both African and European scholars, This article demonstrates Pan-African linguistic and cultural unity and echoes Pan-Africanist scholars' call for African linguistic and cultural unity as a basis for Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance. Uh, Make sure my stream is okay here. It's okay, okay. A couple of people pop in and then pop out, I guess. That's all good. Uh, one of the greatest sons of Europe, historian Basil Davidson, once remarked that whenever anything remarkable or inexplicable turned up in Africa, a whole galaxy of non-African, or at any rate, non-black peoples, were dragged in to explain it. Right? The achievements of the Zimbabweans uh, and the ancient Egyptians 
would be in the process attributed somewhere else. Davidson, 94, against a hostile reception from fellow Europeans, would go on to affirm the black African origin of ancient Egypt civilization. Courageously, he took on the German philosopher Hegel, who knows nothing of Africa, has never been there, is obvious, is oblivious to all the older sources of African knowledge that were extant then as now, yet had the audacity in 1830 to claim that Africa was no historical part of the world. I see we got reverse in the room, PCU reverse, thanks for coming through. Uh, at least I have someone else who's, uh, who's here listening with the show, I appreciate you. All right, another British scholar, uh, Martin Bernal, who argued that Greek culture borrowed heavily from ancient Egypt, a fact that was normal until the intervention of 18th and 19th century racist European scholarship, observes that for the denialist, was simply intolerable for Greece, which was seen not merely as the epitome of Europe, but also as its pure childhood to have the result of the mixture of native Europeans and colonizing Africans, Semites, of, of, of coloni colonizing Africans and Semites. The agonizing dilemma for the races <clears throat> was how to reconcile the sub alternization of the Africans with the fact that ancient Egypt, inconveniently placed on the African continent, could now be the black mother of civilization. I had to take a drink of water there. All right. The racist answer was, firstly, to deny that ancient Egyptians were black. Secondly, to deny that ancient Egyptians had created a true civilization. Thirdly, to make doubly sure by denying both. <laughs> this exercise was aimed at reinforcing the idea, in spite of the opposite obvious, that Africans had no history, no civilization, no philosophy, and no culture. Sadly, this is me talking, this is written down for you to read, for our people to, to read and internalize and acknowledge, and they won't do it. You're called a hotep when you come around kicking this type of game. That's the sad part, all right? Great efforts have been made to rectify the misrepresentations of the African continent's image. But despite such, resilience and resistance to such rectifications of history is relentless. One assiduous insistence that refuses to go away, as Ghanaian philosopher Kwame uh, uh, Gayekai, 1995, points out, is that despite Africans insistence on their cultural unity, quote, the denial of any cultural unity in Africa is maintained to the hilt by a number of scholars. African-American scholar Chancellor Williams notes that aiding and perpetuating the denial of African cultural unity has been the white Africanist scholarship that always concentrates on ethnic differences, tribal antagonisms, hopeless language barriers, and cultural varieties. Williams attributes this emphasis on African differences on the shrewdness of colonialist scholarship, which rightly sees that recognition of African cultural unity would empower Africans and reduce the ill-gotten white power and its domination of the earth. Uh, I see Reverse has corrected me, and that is not the pronunciation 
of the scholar Kwame, which I said, Gayeki. Uh, I've been corrected. Reverse says that the pronunciation is Chichi. Which is interesting. Okay. Chichi. Okay. I stand corrected and I appreciate Reverse for the correcting. That's what we need sometimes. Right? That's what we need. Much appreciated. Uh, before I go any further, you know what? Let me drop the link to the Discord. Uh, because I want you guys who are listening to join the Discord. You can join as either a African-centered curriculum writer, or if you prefer, you can join as a podcast fan. Those, those roles have different permissions, different things you can do. And as I build a server, it'll be enriching for whichever role you have. Curriculum writer, podcast fan, either way, the Discord server will be enriching for you. While on the one hand, the overall aim of colonialist scholarship was to alienate Africans from one another, on the other hand, that's Ghanaian literature academic, uh, Ai Kawai Ama, uh, I'm sure Reverse will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, <clears throat> accurately observes it sought to socialize generations of African children in such a way that they would identify with European values <clears throat> in the practical sense of seeing philosophy as European philosophy, history as European history, literature as European literature. Okay. The history textbooks of first secondary school year required the African children of Arma's time in Ghana to say that before the arrival of Europeans, there was no history but tribal chaos and that Britain was a geographical center of the world. Look at that. <clears throat> Reverse. No, I'm sorry, not reverse. Yeah, reverse said correct. Quadwo to kum full says ah ye kwe ama. Okay. Uh, Quanwo, Quanwo, I think I've seen you here before, right? I think I've seen you here before. Uh, or, or did you change your your screen name or something, but you seem familiar. Either way, I appreciate you being here, all right? Make sure you guys hit the video a thumbs up. It's always funny to me uh, how I have people listening, but you won't hit the thumbs up. Please hit the thumbs up button. Helps me out. The history textbooks of first secondary school year required the African children of our Ma's time in Adana to say that before the arrival of Europeans, there was no history but tribal chaos, and that Britain was a geographical center of the world. The objective was to instill ethnic and destroy African consciousness among Africans. Showing up Africans as nothing more than ethnic, sorry, than, than ethnic groups, I mean, I think they mean ethnic groups, different from one another, having no cultural unity, served the purpose of dividing and rendering them powerless in the face of European colonialism. The quest of Pan-Africanism, a political ideology advancing African unity for African liberation, is the destruction of cultural imperialism and replacement with cultural reclamation, otherwise known as the African Renaissance. An Africanist scholar such as Senegal Sheikh Anta Diop, Ghana's Kwesi uh, Kwa Pra, 
and Kenya's Nguji Wa Fiongo argue that Pan Africanism, African Renaissance projects projects cannot be complete without centralizing African languages. Pan Africanism cannot be complete without centralizing African languages. The pro black perspective is in the room. Appreciate you too. And uh, he says these pronunciation lessons are great. Yeah, that's absolutely great. I appreciate it because, again, being an African outside of the continent, I don't have the taste for the pronunciation, the proper pronunciation of some of these words. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate when you guys break it down phonetically so that those of us who are not familiar with the pronunciation can actually pick it up, all right? So keep it coming. I don't mind, I'm, I'm not insulted by it. I'm empowered. Uh, Diop argues that African languages constitute one linguistic family as homogenous as that of the Indo-European languages. Further noting that linguistic unity dominates all national life argues that without linguistic unity, national cultural unity is what fragile and illusion and, and fragile and illusory. This article argues and seeks to demonstrate that contrary to the insistence that there is no African linguistic cultural unity, such a thing does exist. This article supports the arguments outlined below that advance the notion that those pursuing Pan-Africanist and African Renaissance projects must pay attention to the power of African linguistic and cultural unity as a firm foundation for building and developing Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance. In advancing this argument, I first demonstrate the history of African linguistic unity show how this was undermined, how and why, and argue how it must be rebuilt in the spirit of Pan-Africanism, the African Renaissance. Next, I present African scholars from different African countries in their own voices, attesting to the existence of African cultural unity with reference to certain specifics. <laughs> Quando, uh, sorry, quad, quadwo in the uh, chat room says Diop sounds sounds like a jup. Okay, so shake on to jup. Okay, uh, Reaver, uh, and I appreciate that too. Uh, Reaver says yes, these Europeans left Native Africans' perspective out of their interpretation of African history. That's why they got everything wrong. Okay. I appreciate those comments, guys. Feel free to comment throughout. Okay, correct me. If, if I say something, if I miss say something, correct me. Uh, and if I, and, I, and if you have something you want to add to the reading, just comment it, it in the chat room and I'll read it live on the air. I see that Reverse also says, but what should we expect? They are in war against the African people. Absolutely. Ab absolutely. And African people should be at war with them too. But we got to get ourselves together. So I, I briefly saw a post from Onita Say from the pro black perspective today saying that. We should be focused on a military, but instead we focus on blah, blah, blah. And the, the truth of the matter is what we got to really get focused on, we got to get focused on finding our similarities, right? And pulling ourselves together towards each other based on our similarities, right? So once we get our heads right, we will get our armies right. Right. Okay. 
Okay, so it's 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 joke. Okay, shake on to joke. Okay, gotcha. Squad will give me a, some more lessons. Shake on to joke. Okay, cool. Right, so let's move on with the paper to continue. We come to this section called African Linguistic Unity. Uh, before I read the section, I see reverse says military, but who should train us? Africa has militaries, they have military leaders to train ourselves, right? Who trained Shaka Zulu? Right? Or any of the, you know, our ancestral fighters, right? We train ourselves. Um, African linguistic unity. Prehistoric times, Africans were concentrated in the Great Lakes region, uh, according to Job 1987. Some moved to the Nile Valley and built the ancient Egyptian civilization. Later, others migrated to the west and the south of Africa, building the civilizations of Ghana, Noke, Aif, Zimbabwe, and others. This common origin of the African people serves as a basis for the argument of a common ling linguistic background or one linguistic family. Right? Africans in West Africa have common languages despite the existence of local dialects that were used as languages of trade and government. But with the arrival of European colonialism, African official languages were replaced with those of European languages. Isn't that something? It's a hell of a thing to be conquered, boy. Right? It's a hell of a thing to be conquered. African official languages were replaced with those of European languages. When this took place, local dialects surfaced and competed with national cultural languages. Consequently, linguistic unity was undermined, more especially as the demands of daily life required learning the European language. That's an interesting concept there, right? That the idea being that when these Europeans came through, they seem to have been like this scramble for different African uh, tongues to be expressed. And then of course, even that was undermined when the Europeans demanded that folks learn their language. That's an interesting phenomenon. That's an interesting phenomenon. Instead of continuing with the national language or, or, or the common language, right? Groups started really getting heavy on the dialects. I wonder if that was a defense mechanism. If anyone knows, let me know. Was that a kind of a defense mechanism? Uh, a, a form of resistance? Why that happened? Because the common language could be conquered, you know, could be infiltrated more, right? To continue, in a quest to bring out the profound African cultural unity still alive beneath the deceptive appearance of cultural heterogeneity, heterogeneity uh, uh, Joe, 1989, research on pre-colonial Africa, a study in African historical sociology, gave him the confidence that his research would enable Africans to sense deep within ourselves a true reinforcement of our feeling of cultural oneness. His act of reviving the African past was done, as he points out, while remaining strictly within the realm of science. In approaching scholarship, Jope and Ivan van Sertema, 1986, insisted that all the scientists of the world must be united around the idea of finding the scientific truth and nothing else. This insistence was informed by the realization that ideological facts 
have done a great deal of harm to the work of science. That is a fact. Huh? If it wasn't for certain ideologies, science would be much further ahead than it is right now. Right? If you didn't colonize peoples, destroy their way of life, enslave folks, uh, the, 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 the brain, uh, the, 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 the later years, it was actual brain drain from the continent. You know, black peoples were serving their intelligence up to, you know, to white endeavors, right? If it wasn't for that, science, for example, science and engineering, technology, all that would be much further than what it is. <clears throat> to continue, one of the harms inflicted by ideological scientists, as Joe Pin, uh, observes, is racist European scholarship's effort to prove that the <clears throat> average European brain is larger than that of the average African. This false sense of European society has had tragic and long-lasting cultural consequences. It is, as Halen, 2009, points out, that for long times, Africans had to suffer both cultural and intellectual humiliation at the hands of a Western imperialism whose scholars presume to understand more about Africans and their cultures than Africans themselves. So instead of using conjecture about the unity of African culture and the blackness of Egypt, Job employs scientific research and was transparent about his methodology. Proving the blackness or Africanness of ancient Egypt, Job employed a linguistic approach. His study revealed the existence of common words between Wolof, Senegalese language, and the ancient Egyptian language. Later, Ame uh, would find words in his Akan language that were not only pronounced the same way, but had the same meaning as in the ancient Egyptian language. Lending his support for the African cultural unity thesis, Davidson in 1994 notes, there are profound unities which seem to underlie the cultures of the greater part of the continent. Basing his position on linguistic studies, by these scholars. Huh? In the in the <clears throat> in the comments, reverse says I heard that Ivan Van Sertema <clears throat> and Jew and Joe Although they were very proud African conscious, they both had a white wife. What do you think about that? Um, I think it is problematic. I think it shows a lack of, uh, what's the word? Um, a lack of discipline. Uh, but do we, do you throw the baby out with the bathwater? Right? It is possible to devour the, the meat and spit out the bones, as they say, right? Um, and so, you know, am I going to throw out this work that he, that, he, that say, Jopa's done in linguistics to prove, not that we needed, not that we necessarily need proving in terms of proving it to the Europeans, <clears throat> but for our own people's sake, they ought to understand that, hey, what you learn in the public fool system <clears throat> here or on the continent or in between uh, is, is nonsense. And here's the facts. I'm not gonna throw that away, right? Uh, Quad O says, yes, he and Baba Theophile Obenga worked with Nana Job on the linguistic aspect, right? So yeah, so reverse, um, what I would say is <clears throat> you can judge the man for his personal action, but you gotta 
in my opinion, you got to look at the total work that was done, right? The total work that was done. And, and that, that leads me to a quote I'm going to finish the show off with. I think it's an important quote. I'm going to borrow from another teacher. I'm going to finish the show with the quote. So stick around for that quote. It's very important. To continue, this similarity was not by chance. This similarity was not by chance. There is a scientific explanation for it. That being that it had to do with migrations of ancient Egyptians to Senegal and old Ghana. Hence the similarity on one hand of words between Senegal's language, Wolof, and that of the ancient Egyptians. And on the other hand, the similarity between Akan, the Ghanaian language, and that of ancient Egypt. The efforts of linking ancient Egyptians to the rest of other Africans had to be made to disprove the prejudiced and racist European scholarship, which attempted to prove at any price that the Egyptians were whites, right? So, the, so again, the, the proof, they're proving this stuff. It, it's really for, uh, it's for our people, right? And if our people in mass could see how this lie from the European was the, was disproved. I, this is just my belief. I believe guys like Jope et, et al. Uh, was thinking, well, that will wake people up to all the other lies that they're teaching you in school and in history books and whatnot. Television, novels, you know, everything. An interesting study of the life of the late Tanzanian president uh, Cambaraj Julius Nyerere indicates that a group came from Egypt through Sudan when they arrived in what became known as Tanganyika they divided one group going to I'm going to probably butcher this um, Ukeroi another to Uranj uh, after which they migrated to Busegwe and a third group went to Sukuma. The Sukuma group left and came to occupy Uzanaki. Right? The area was of the was of the Zanaki people whose roots were traced to the ancient Egyptian people. You see, this is so uh, again, you're gonna have to hear it from me because it's so important. This is why African centered Education is so important. And apparently it's not just important important outside of the continent, it's just as important inside of the continent. And right here, you know, in this little passage I read here, that's a geography lesson. That's geography lessons as a matter of fact, right? If you guys uh, tuned in when I did the reading of the uh, African mythology uh myths and folk tales the other day you know i kind of broke it down in that episode so if you if you didn't catch it go back and check out that episode i did maybe two two episodes ago right where i read some african mythology stories and i showed how in these stories you get so much you, you get an opportunity at so much they're talking about african animals they're talking about african tribes they're talking about you know african uh traditions, you know, different African cultures. And right there, if you have the right people put in the work together, we can put, we can create these stories for the young ones to be fully immersed. And, and, and they can get, they can get that, that knowledge in their English classes, their history classes, their science classes, you know, you, etc. And while I'm saying this, if you're not already a part of the Discord, I posted the link earlier in the chat room. I'll post it again. All right? Make sure to join the Discord. 
you can join the discord as a, a as a as a member of the writing team or as a fan of the podcast but the writing team is where we're working on well is where we're supposed to be working on the curriculum stuff all right more on that later uh reverse says uh wait uh Quadro says Nana Ivan Van Sotima divorces Eurasian wife. Reverse says, right, I'm grateful for their work. Great people with bad choices. LOL. Just kidding. Now you're not a kid about that. That's just what it is. There's an inconsistency in many human beings. Africans included. And if you're not diligent about your doings about how you proceed in life, you're bound to make certain ill mistakes. Even while you're doing great works for the people. I don't excuse it per se, but I'm not gonna let it stop me from taking in the knowledge. That's my thing. I, 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 I would like to ask those brothers if they were around what really, you know, considering the work you were doing, what really made you decide to go that way? You know, I would be curious to hear that. To hear, has, 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 has had anyone asked them that in life? Does anyone know? And, and if so, what was the answer? I'd be curious to hear that. Uh, with reference to people speaking, East. Nyanza Bantu languages, a study suggests that as they lived among people speaking other languages, they diversified over time as they separated. The study further reveals that although local convention recognizes each of the Western Serengeti languages as a separate language today, they are all closely related and thus linguistically represent one group of people with a common heritage of the past. The recognition of Africans, common heritage by Africans, was and continues to be diminished by attempts to undermine African languages. This brings us to a section of the paper called Attempts to Destroy African Languages and the Implications Thereof. Uh, I'm going to take a quick uh, co commercial break, station ID, etc. But I want to thank all you who are here with us. I want to thank you guys in the chat room who, who are making this a livelier discussion. I'll be back on the other side. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And we're back. We are back. I uh, just had to take a quick ID break, take a sip of water, and now we're back. So at this uh, section of the paper, attempts to destroy African languages and the implications thereof. Wa Fiongo uh, has observed that any language has a dual character both a means of communication carry of culture and that language as culture is a collective memory banks memory bank of a people's experience and history if african language is a memory bank of a people's history then suppressing and degrading the languages of the colonized meant also marginalizing the memory they carried and elevating to universe, universal, universality, uh, the memory carried by the language of the conqueror. This observation 
vindicates Job's research and arguments in favor of Africans' common linguistic heritage as a basis of Pan-Africanism. In illustrating how European colonialists sought to destroy Africans' memory through an attempt to destroy African languages. By the way, I think that's a, I think that's a brilliant concept, right? To point out, a brilliant concept to point out to our, to our people is how these folks try to destroy our memory through, try, through the attempt to destroy our language. If you don't think about language deep enough, you wouldn't realize how, what all is communicated in a language. As a matter of fact, for us of African descent, out here, you know, outside of the continent, speaking French and English, that, sh that communicates we were dominated. And the further along we go with the languages without ever reconnecting or reclaiming, right, some African languages is the more dominated we will be. When I talked about, when I did the episode, two or three episodes back where I, where I read the stories, that's the other thing I mentioned, like, we were reading stories from different regions of the continent, different peoples across the continent. And I mentioned that you could get little children, you know, and then expand upon it later, but a part of their language study, right, from an early age would be, you know, read these stories of these peoples, what was the language? Learn how to say certain simple things, hello, goodbye, you know, unity, right? Let's work together. I'm an African. They could learn those, you know, simple sentences and stuff, right? In all these different languages. And in this way, they start to vibrate with what the, you know, they start to vibrate with what the language carries. Wa Fiongo's, uh, Fiongo tells of a story in colonial Kenya where African children in school were punished for speaking the African languages. African children were caned and made to carry plaques inscribed with the words, I am stupid or I am an ass. Imagine that. Some cases, African children's mouths were stuffed with pieces of paper picked up from the waste paper basket, which were then passed from one mouth to that of the latest offender. It is for this reason that Wafiongo is correct in observing that in Africa, while the bullet served as a means of physical subjugation, language served as a means of spiritual subjugation. Man, we we don't think about stuff like like I I it it didn't you know I of course I I understood and knew uh you know that folks's language was was made secondary and tertiary to the colonizers I I do understand that but like the real weight of it the heaviness of it, you know that 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 bullet is one thing but that language is a whole other thing to continue it is for this reason that Wafiongo argues that it is wrong for african writers especially the radical and pro african type to take it as axiomatic that the renaissance of african cultures lay in the languages of europe the chat room Reverse says, I think they were all afraid to ask them. Or it was a weapon of the enemy to destroy our scholars by allowing them to engage with their women. So he, he's responding to the question I asked, 
Did anyone ever ask, you know, uh, the teacher Jope and others who were who were uh, misogynists why they made those choices? You know, to to marry and and lay up with and some cases have children with these 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 European women. And he said, I think they were all afraid. To, uh, he said, you know, because I. I also asked, did anyone ever ask those questions of them when they were around? The reverse says, I think they were all afraid to ask them. But it was a weapon of the enemy to destroy our scholars by allowing them to engage with their women. Yeah, because, you know, we have, we, we've long had that belief, if you start laying up with white women and stuff, we really ain't trying to hear you. You know? Uh... Reverse goes on to say, yes, this all boils down to a war. Race and the culture, history of a people is declaring war on those people. Yeah, it's death. Anyone declaring death on you is at war with you, right? Reverse goes on to say, wow, that's heavy. I think he was saying that's heavy when I was reading this part here where uh, African children were caned and made to carry plaques and scribe with the words, I am stupid. Oh, I am an ass. That is heavy. Or he could be referring, or reverse could be referring to when I said, <clears throat> uh, the bullet served as a means of physical subjugation, but language served as a means of spiritual subjugation. Right? The reverse goes on to say, language is expression of the soul group. Uh, yeah, of the soul group. Quadro comes back and he says, Nana John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben used to give Nana Ivan Franz Sotomayor the business about that Eurasian wife. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like I remember reading that before. Quadro, I, I do believe I remember, I vaguely remember reading that before. You know, what are you doing? And by the way, who's these mans and them friend? Your friends didn't have the sense to tell you, hey, brother, I, you know, I don't think you should really do that. You could lose all credibility out here, which is more damaging to our people than anything else. To continue, what is the difference between a politician who says Africa cannot do without imperialism and the writer who says Africa cannot do without European languages, right? Great question. <clears throat> While I am fully supportive of Wafi Ongo's encouragement to African writers to write in African languages in order, firstly, <clears throat> to communicate with the masses of the African people who cannot speak European languages, and secondly, to develop African languages, I am not in agreement with him when he disowns literature written by Africans in European languages, whether English, French, Spanish, or Portuguese. That's an important point, right? That's, that that kind of goes with even like what we're, what we're talking about in the chat room with, <clears throat> with like Jope and them, you know, marrying up on these white women, right? We, we, we can't just toss out <clears throat> the things that make sense, right? You can't just ignore the African who's written in, a, you know, a foreign tongue due to circumstances, right? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta leave room for that too, to a certain extent. But you do wanna for, you, you do wanna push African languages first and foremost, right? Such an approach is not sympathetic to descendants of Africans who were uprooted from the African continent, like I was saying, and taken as slaves to foreign lands where they were forced, firstly, to abandon their African languages, and secondly, to write in and speak in European languages. Referring to literature written by Africans in European languages, Wafiongo argues that this is not African literature, but Afro-European literature. 
why Fiongo is not alone in holding this position. For Pra, 2017, reference to literature written by Africans in European languages is not only a gross anomaly, but one of the most eminent problems for the decolonization project in African education to resolve. Unlike Wa Thiongo's Thiongo, Pra does not even accommodate this type of literature as Afro-European literature. Saying what these literatures uh, present is in fact English, French, Spanish, Portuguese literatures. To suggest that African literature is in English, French, and Portuguese is to deny a cultural linguistic identity for Africa. It is to say that Africans are first and foremost creatures of their erstwhile colonial overlords. So here, <clears throat> so th this, this is actually a pretty good debate. What do you guys think of these statements? You guys in the chat room over here live with me. What do you guys think of these opposing thoughts, right? That the African outside of the continent, a descendant of the, of the, of the motherland, right? <clears throat> Because they're writing in English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, what have you, right? That you disregard them and their works as any kind of African literature. Instead, looking at, looking at it, viewing it as Afro-European literature, right? Or do you follow what the author of the paper is saying, that no, we should consider that you know, we should, we should have some considerations for those folks too, right? You see, my thing is, my problem is, <clears throat> if you're talking about Pan-Africanism, meaning Africans everywhere, right? You can, you can destroy, you know, certain progress when you look at it that way like for instance i'm gonna i want to name drop here and you guys should check out his books by the way but let's take a guy like only tasse is he not an african only tasse is the host of the pro-black perspective author of the book of power and the, the pro-black compendium and uh the other book zubiri and the maroons of maa right uh, are we gonna disregard him as african and belittle his works as just, you know, call them like Afro-European literature? Nah, I don't think so, right? So it's something that we need to really wrestle with and we need to, to bend it to a certain will. And I think the will should be of keeping the idea of Pan-Africanism. We're all African. We have different, you know, we have a set of circumstances and this is why we do things the way we do it. Now, the thing is, too, right, if you do a work, and, I, and I've heard only to say talk about this, too. If you do a work in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, I, I do believe you have a responsibility to also see that work done, you know, uh, translated into, you know, a few African languages. You know, at, 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 at least, you know, Swahili. I'm working on this thing, and that's one of the things I, I'm keeping in mind. That you gotta, you know, you do have to translate it at some point. Right? Uh, to continue. However, neither Wa Fiong not prize the first to raise the objection as early as 1948. Jope argued that every literary work necessarily belongs to the language in which it is written. Works written by Africans in foreign languages thus belong first and foremost in those foreign languages and cannot, and cannot justifiably be considered as monuments of an African literature. Right? While Wathiongo encourages African creative writers to write in African languages, he cautions that writing in African languages per se is not an end in itself. 
saying, but writing in our language per se, although a necessary first step in the correct direction, <clears throat> will not in itself bring about the renaissance in African cultures if that literature does not carry the content of our people's anti-imperialist struggles to liberate their productive forces from foreign control. The content of the need for unity among the workers and peasants of all the nationalities in their struggle to control the wealth they produce and to free it from internal and external parasites. The quest for communication in African language is not merely sentimental, but is informed by crucial and practical developmental needs. Considering that 90% of, Af- of the population in Africa speaks indigenous African languages, it makes logical sense that all types of knowledge must be delivered in African languages, failing which the people who constitute the majority of Africa will be marginalized. <clears throat> Continued use of our former colonial masters, Jude correctly observes, is a convenient way to avoid facing the true complaints of the population, who may be illiterate, but are not without good sense. Yeah, so like I said, definitely you want to, if, you, if you're out here doing work, right? And, and, and you know, this, this kind of opens up the, the, the old conversation that, well, we, we just all need to be in Africa. Right? But in lieu of that, for the time being at least, <clears throat> you know, I say write in whatever your tongue is, translate for the people and convey the spirit here, you know, convey this spirit here that, that was talked about. Make sure it carries the content of our people's anti imperialist struggles to liberate their productive forces from foreign control right and that's how we should be looking at whatever work we're doing right whatever work we're doing that should be the impetus behind it chat room uh Reverse says, yeah, as I already said, they want to erase their root. So then they become confused because without the root, you have no ground. And this is what happened to the enslaved diaspora. Quato says, I would say written in an African language, then translate to the other languages. Uh, uh, Quato, I agree if you're on the continent, right? But if you're out here like some of us are outside the continent and you don't know the language, you have to write in the language that you speak and then translate it, right? Uh, Reverse says two people do not like your video. So we can assume they are against your work and therefore have made themselves to enemies. Uh, Yeah, that could be for different reasons. Uh, I recently did a, a rant or two rants commenting on a American, a black American a comedian and some drama that they were going through. Um, that could be some of that stuff happening where they've decided to thumbs down my videos whenever they see it. Or it could just be, you know, a self-hating African. And by African, I mean all of us inside and out of the continent who hates to see or hear about people talking positive, you know, type stuff. Uh, Reverse, sorry. Uh, Quadro says, primary is the African language. First cross African language to language in the continent, then into other languages. Reverse says, there are six people, only four likes. Two like left. Four friends and two enemies. Uh, Quadro says we teach languages. Quadro, when you say we teach languages, what do you mean exactly? Uh, expand on that a little bit. And Quadro, are you in the? Are you on my Discord server? Are you in there? If you are, or if you aren't, click the link, join the Discord. But that's something I want to start getting to. I want to start get 
getting more continental Africans in the Discord and participating at that. And I would like to see us start working on some language stuff too. Right? Because again, we're talking about this African centered curriculum. We should be discussing language or languages, African languages at an early age or early grade for our people. Reverse then says three now, meaning I got three dislikes. Oh, Quad, well, you're on a BB to me. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, a, a BB to me has languages. You're right. There's languages being talked, being taught then. Now, now you let me know. We've talked there before. Okay, brother. Now I know. Now I know uh, that we've actually interacted before. Uh, I, I think you and I were supposed to discuss getting um, my podcast up and running there, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're the brother. It's a, I think it's you. But in, in any event, I appreciate you guys who are here. And uh, if you haven't already, give me a thumbs up. We already see the enemy of such things. African are giving me thumbs down, right? So counteract that with the thumbs up. Okay, counteract that with some thumbs up. Uh, share, um, you know, share to BB to me, uh, share to your social networks, etc. Right? To continue. But how will the development of many different African languages help to build a spirit of Pan-Africanism, considering that many Africans do not speak one another's languages, and therefore cannot communicate? The answer to this is the express need for one African continental language that will be used for official purposes for the entire continent. That's according to you, to Joe. The answer to this is the express need for one African continental language that will be used for official purposes for the entire continent. Kiswahili, a language spoken in Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa, has not only been proposed as an African continental language, but a world language. While the call for an African continental language is both revolutionary and noble, <clears throat> the fear of linguistic domination of one ethnic group by another should not be underestimated. In a recent informal conversation in 2017 with a Ghanaian diplomat who works for the African Union, an organization tasked with the project of African unity, this anxiety came out strongly. This anxiety was similarly expressed in another informal conversation in 2017 with a fellow African in Juba, South Sudan. Jope in 1996 is sensitive to this fear on the part of Africans who have noted that one group will always end up imposing its language on another. And if that were to be the case, why not keep European languages, which are already in use, and make everybody speak them? But well, that's a... Both the Ghanaian and South Sudanese citizens made this strong argument. We got a side eye Ghanaian, Sudanese, South Sudanese Africans. Okay. Next, we present African scholars in their own voices examining African cultural, African cultural that are pan African, in that they are not only found in one ethnic group. Interestingly and ironically, <clears throat> It is by studying ethnic cultural values that exposes the existence of African cultural unity. This brings us to a section called African Cultural Unity. <clears throat> Scientific study of African culture reveals that one, ancestor, uh, ancestor reverence, and two, Africans' attitude to land among many common features are pan-African cultural values. In support of this argument, Wa Thiongo, observes that the dead as part of the living and of the unborn is the one common thread in African thought and experience. This 
Buddhist belief in life after death and the ancestor spirits was a strong feature in ancient Egyptian society. Leading British philosopher Bertrand Russell to point out that ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death. Yet this preoccupation with death was in fact a preoccupation with life after death. Death being a constant reminder that life in this world was transient. It was this consciousness that contributed to the philosophical unity of those who had paused on, or who had passed on, those who are alive, and those yet to be born. This outlook taught the living to honor the departed through upholding good deeds and eschewing selfish and eschewing selfishness, so that those yet to come would inherit a hospitable world. With beautiful eloquence, Wathiongo explains this Pan-African notion of the dead, the living, and those yet to be born. Thus, the past becomes the source of inspiration, the present, the arena of perspiration, and the future, our collective aspiration. Like that. Right? The present is about putting in work. Right? Be inspired by the past, put in that work today and so that the future, we can all see what we all hope to see for ourselves, for our people. That is why coming to the second cultural factor, uh, Chi Chi, as I learned today, uh, notes that many writers have recognized that land was a communal property in all traditional African societies. Empathetically, Nigerian sociologist uh, Oyeronke Oyewimi uh, observes that in the 19th century in Yoruba land, as in parts of Africa, land was not a commodity to be individually owned, bought and sold. Africans anticipated that if the land were bought and sold, the rich, as in the case in the modern world, would buy and own everything, whilst the poor own nothing. This is why you got to look at African philosophy. I, I be reading some Yoruba philosophy from time to time. Hopefully in the future, I intend to read some Ghanaian proverbs, you know, philosophies in the, in the near future. <clears throat> Ghanaian philosopher Kwasi Wiridu, justifying his reference to Ghanaian culture, notes that he does not wish to pretend that the whole of Ghana, or even more incredibly, the whole of Africa, has one homogenous traditional culture. Considering that there are in Ghana a variety of ethnic groups with, with traditional cultures that differ in some respects, he argues that nevertheless, there are deep underlying affinities running through these cultures, which justify speaking of a Ghanaian traditional culture. By the same logic, uh, where we do, 1980, argues that one might speak of the traditional culture of Africa, though with a more, with a more a, attenuation of content. Similarly observes that even in the light of the multiplicity of African cultures and diversities among them, it is, however, also true that in many instances, the different cultural forms of practices can be said to be especially, yeah, sorry, essentially variations on the same theme. And that, my friends, brings us to the conclusion. Before I read the conclusion, let me check out what's going on in the chat room. Reverse. Reverse says, so our only purpose is to be trained as soldier. Should that be our ultimate purpose for now, to overthrow the system of worldwide oppression? The verse goes on to say, actually it's pronounced uh, Gigi, not Chi-Chi, Gigi, right? Is that it, Gigi or Jai Jai? Is it Gigi or Jai Jai, right? Is it Gigi or Jai Jai? Right. Um, 
in the chat Pado comes in and says reverse would not would not that be Jai Che KY makes the ch sound like uh like chia in mechia in mechia wool reverse says or jai chi right this is absolutely correct and then quato says right uh quato says right um ky ch sound but all good good read tonight yeah i appreciate it and i appreciate you guys breaking down the pronunciations um this is going to help people who come along and watch the video in the future or listen to the podcast when i finally get these up back on uh back on the podcast apps um it'll help them you know so it helps me and it helps others and i appreciate you guys for doing that so we're at the conclusion of this paper, right? This article has sought to argue that Africans are related and connected to one another culturally, and that the African languages reflect this reality. This being the case, in their quest to find one another and unite for the purpose of their total liberation on the basis of Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance, their languages and culture should form the basis for the realization of these objectives. However, in advancing these arguments, one is not oblivious to the painful reality that centuries of colonial rule and Eurocentric education have alienated Africans from themselves and one another. While the cause of African unity, Pan-Africanism, and the quest for an African cultural reclamation or African, uh, African Renaissance, are highly desirable. The declared desire will remain just that, a desire. Unless a conscious Afrocentric education is employed to bring back African self-consciousness without which no African Renaissance is possible. Uh, have I not been talking about this? It is the preponderance of ethnic self-consciousness the absence of African self-consciousness that makes Africans comfortable with being united by European languages, but afraid of the possibility of being united by an African language. Such a fear is real and genuine, kept alive and burning by some African leaders who drive by destructive, who, who driven by destructive tribalism have misused their power to privilege their own ethnic groups at the expense of others. It is leaders who, in word and practice, demonstrate commitment to the entire African people who will be able to bring to the consciousness of African people that genuine liberation and development is dependent on Pan-Africanism and African Renaissance ideas, and that these ideas will be realized only when the ordinary African woman and man is actively engaged in the realization of African freedom and we talked about this in past episodes where we get these african leaders from they pass through the rigors of an african-centered education it's a must right and that was the paper today pan-african linguistic and cultural unity a basis for pan-africanism in the african renaissance Uh, Quadro says not on the continent in Jersey. Also, right. In fact, your other brother who I believe did the uh, update on abibitumi.com. Uh, reverse says it's pronounced J like in Jesus. So it's J. It's J. Chi. It's Jechi. So the, that, that name is Jechi. Okay. Uh, and, and, and guys, whenever we tackle these readings, you know, if you're here, we tackle these readings, and if I'm butchering a pronunciation, 
by all means feel no ways about it help uh help to correct me and correct others who are who are paying attention to this broadcast okay so that's been the uh episode uh the thing i want to end off with though is the reminder that you know there's work to be done right and this curriculum project that we have for the podcast here it's very important stuff and i know we all have things that we're doing we get busy with our lives etc but the question you gotta ask yourself is do you do you want to be the ancestor who has to answer or, or you know the elder who has to answer to your lineage right why didn't you do more how were you so busy that you couldn't put in some work on something solid for us why did we have to start from scratch like you did and and you being their grandfather grandmother or great grandfather great grandmother right or being an ancestor who's moved on to the next life right do you really want to have to answer those kind of questions and the thing is you don't even have to do the work uh by yourself i'm glad to roll up my sleeves coordinate uh, help with the work delegates you know delegate things for me to do etc like there's people who are willing to do the work we gotta start making time for these things right now in the discord i got a, a good handful of uh you know out of the dozen or so people on on the discord i got like a handful of responses to the curriculum critique and i appreciate it I'd like to discuss it, and I've been wanting to discuss it for a little while now. And can't seem to get folks to respond on the Discord. To say, hey, Thursday? Fine, I'll be there. We got all, you know, all whatever time is good for the collective. We gotta start, uh, we gotta start uh, putting time aside and putting some work into this the latest thing i posted was the book considerations a sister reached out to me and you know the sister is she's on the discord she's talking about that to me today she was upset of how scant right how scant the book selections are for the curriculum that we critiqued and she really wishes like i do that we all can sit down and actually figure out what books we need to push, especially to those younger grades, to, 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 to the earlier learners. You know, we gotta put in the work. And the sister hit me with a, with a, a statement um, by a teacher, you know, but uh, uh, by, by the teacher Baruti, right? And he has this saying that goes, "Be an African worth remembering." And that's a, that, and I want to leave you guys with that with that word right there. Be an African worth remembering. There's an opportunity here, right? Join join me on the Discord. Right? Ask me how can I help? Right? Um, in the chat room. Quato says, is there a way to bring to a baby to me in, in the future? Um, in, in the future, we can do that. 
but right now I put in some time building up the Discord. Discord is an app. And uh and uh you know it's it's easy it's easier um to really to really do the things that I like to do there's a as far as this uh project is concerned. And so I'd appreciate it if folks join the Discord. We can all join a, a baby to me as well. There's no problem. There's no issue there. I, I'm already on there, as you know. Uh, but for this project, I like it to be on the Discord. I, I, I like how it's set up. I like how it's trending, all right? But being African worth being remembered, all right? Hey, look, guys, I appreciate you all for joining me tonight. Uh, I'll... I'll, I'll I'll, I'll hit you up later. I appreciate you guys joining me tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed the reading. Um, I got to find some resources that talks a little bit more about the language uh, transfer from Egypt to uh, other regions of the continent, right? But I hope you enjoyed the paper all the same. I hope you see the reasoning uh, behind the uh, the idea that linguistics and cultural unity is what will be the basis of true Pan-Africanism. And until next time, which will be on Thursday, I hope you guys be, be well. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.